Well, my name is uh, Dr. Kevin Churchwell. I'm the CEO of the Children's Hospital Riddle, the Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. And I just want to just provide a welcome to Senator Corker. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here today. I also want to welcome everyone who had a chance and uh, took the time to come out today. Uh, just a little bit of history about the Children's Hospital. Uh, we've been a freestanding Children's Hospital since 2004, uh, and uh, we've been very busy. And that our hospital is what we call a tertiary or quaternary care children's hospital, meaning that any child in this region, any child in this state that needs really intensive care, really high specialized care, is referred to us. And so we are the referral for all the other children's hospitals for the state and the surrounding region. And our uh, surrounding region for us means that we extend over 120 miles. We have children coming from southern Kentucky and northern Alabama who need care and come to us for their care. And with that, uh, I have to tell you, we've been pretty busy. Uh, we've been running occupancy rates of over 88 to 95 percent. And usual, usually in a hospital, when you get about 80 percent, you get a little worried about how things go. Uh, so because of that, uh, we need to expand our hospital. And uh, we are act in active plans in terms of looking at our expansion uh, with the number of beds, uh, increasing our number of pediatric beds, and also uh, working to expand our services, looking at incorporating obstetrics into our children's hospital. We believe that's important because of another problem, a major problem that we know of in this state, and that's the problem of infant mortality. There are a lot of reasons why uh, that we have a very high infant mortality rate. We rank 46 in the nation, Tennessee does, in terms of infant mortality. 46 isn't a good number in this regard. And we are committed to make a difference with that with our other institutions, with our other children's hospitals. And we believe part of that solution is to bring obstetrics within children's hospitals so that the care that any premature infant needs is right there, right at the moment that they need it. So, Senator Corker, we look forward to working with you with that and any help you can provide, we greatly appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased also to introduce our Chancellor, Nick Zeppos. Chancellor Zeppos is relatively new to the role as Vanderbilt's eighth chancellor as of March 1st, but he certainly is not new to Vanderbilt. Since 1987, he has served the university as an assistant professor, an associate dean, associate provost, provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. Chancellor Zeppos is a distinguished legal scholar, teacher, and executive who understands the complexities of health care and is eager for Vanderbilt to play a role in the national debate on this issue. I am delighted to welcome him back to the Children's Hospital and to this panel discussion today. Chancellor Zeppelin. Thank you, Kevin and uh, Senator. It's a pleasure to be here. I think if you can get the lawyers to sit down here with the doctors, we can solve any problem here in, in America. Um, thank you so much, and let me welcome Senator Corker uh, to this uh, very, very exciting panel on health care reform. I want to introduce the senator and all of our panelists, but before I do that, I really want to thank him for allowing Vanderbilt to host this event and to contribute uh, significantly to the discussion and the solutions uh, that have to come in this important area of policy. Uh, we all understand that there are 47 million Americans who do not have health care coverage. They don't receive adequate care, but importantly, don't receive adequate preventive care. They have chronic conditions that are not managed, and then significantly and measurably, these contribute to anxiety and stress and other things that only exacerbate the health care challenges that this important po underserved population has. Now, for those of us who are fortunate enough to have coverage, they worry about losing that coverage. They worry about a job lost and switching. Uh, to a new policy, getting a new job, going to a job that perhaps does not pay for health insurance. Then for those health care providers, particularly the safety net providers like Metro General and Vanderbilt, we face significant challenges and increasing costs for the uncompensated care that we address. In the case of Vanderbilt, in fiscal year 2008, we will have approximately $92 million in uncompensated care. And let me emphasize, we are a not-for-profit institution. We are an Ely Mazenary institution devoted to research, discovery, teaching, and health care. But when we have a system that does not address this issue, 
It simply means that those costs are paid elsewhere. And the funds that are not then available to address the compelling health care needs that our nation faces. So we do accept this, but we think that the system needs dramatic improvement. Uh, let me introduce some of our distinguished panelists, all of our distinguished panelists here today. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Bill Stead, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at Vanderbilt. Uh, Nancy Annis, Vice President of Advocacy, Access, and Community Clinics at St. Thomas Hospital. Uh, Dr. Reginald Coopwood, CEO of the Nashville Metro General Hospital. Uh, my good friend, Colleen Conway Welch, the Dean of the Vanderbilt School of, Medis uh, the Vanderbilt School of Nursing. <laughs> That's all right, Kelly. <laughs> I did that. I did. I did that to see if Harry would jump, but he's not here. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Wayne Wiley, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. Uh, Tom Heron, the CEO of the Great Centennial Medical Center. Darren Gordon, director of the Important Ten Care Program. Uh, my good friend and. Uh, uh, I will say my physician, Dr. Jim Georges, Medical Director of Internal Medicine at Vanderbilt. Dr. Mark Friese, Director of our Regional Informatics Program at Vanderbilt. Uh, good friend Martin Sandler, Associate Vice Chancellor for Hospital Affairs and former Chair of the Department of Radiology. Uh, let me just again introduce Kevin Churchwell, the CEO of this magnificent Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital. I want to recognize our Interim Dean and Associate Vice Chancellor for uh, uh, research. Jeff Balzer is here today. Uh, also with us are Dr. Michael Minch, Dr. Ken Moore, and uh, Dr. Bob Kirkpatrick, but I don't think he might not have joined us today. Let me turn now to uh, the panel and let me tell you a little bit about Senator Corker. Senator Corker has, uh, in an admirable and energetic way, focused on what are the priorities for this state and for this nation. And he has said, I have three priorities, and one of them is health care. He has co-sponsored co -sponsored legislation to make private coverage available to more, more Americans, and he's been very, very responsive to the concerns of the health care providers in the state of Tennessee. We are particularly pleased and appreciate his strong support for legislation to provide Tennessee with an allocate allocation of the Medi Medicaid disproportionate share hospital payments and to maintain federal Medicaid payments for graduate medical education. Uh, Vanderbilt is uh, an academic medical center. We not only train uh, uh, medical students, we have hundreds of residents uh, trained here who go out into every town, county in Tennessee and across this nation. So we are very, very committed not just to training doctors who work in our medical center, but doctors all around this great state. Um, I will have to say that in my time with Senator Corker, we are very lucky that we can call him our senator. He is a problem solver. He is a pragmatist. He knows how to work with others to reach across and find the common ground uh, rather than finding the differences. And while these challenges in health care may seem insurmountable, daunting to many, I am very, very confident with Senator Corker serving in the United States Senate as a senator from Tennessee, great progress will be made. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Bob Corker. He graduated from that other great uh, university in Tennessee, the University of Tennessee, and he started a construction company in Chattanooga that eventually expanded its operation to 18 states. Beginning in 1994, uh, this uh, 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 loyal public servant served for two years as Tennessee Commissioner of Finance and Administration, where he gained an intimate understanding of the health system in Tennessee. In 2001, he was elected the mayor of Chattanooga, did great work in that uh, uh, wonderful Tennessee city. And in November 2007, he was elected to represent Tennessee in the United States Senate. He and his wife Elizabeth have two daughters in college, so I know he appreciates all the great things that we do at universities, but also the rising cost of higher education as well. <laughs> That's our second panel. Uh, so let me thank you again, Bob, for your leadership and your responsiveness to our concerns and for engaging this, us in this roundtable today. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. I am uh, somewhat overwhelmed uh, by this uh, group of people who are gathered here. Can you all hear me okay? Um, 
I, uh, one of the great things about serving in the Senate <clears throat> is a tremendous access to information that you have. And certainly all of you being here today on a day right after a holiday uh, is a privilege for me to, to be able to hear from you, to talk with you a little bit about health care. The reason that we're here in Chancellor, thanks for making all this happen, Dr. Churchwell, for certainly allowing me to tour some of the facilities and meet Dr. Patel and go through your pediatric clinic. But the reason we're here right now is to, to, is we know that right after this next presidential race, we have the best opportunity, I think, in recent times to really do something as it relates to health care and health insurance in general. Uh, that is going to be, I think, uh, right now, obviously, uh, gasoline prices uh, uh, are the thing that uh, most people are, is the thing that most people are talking about today. I know that at some point during this presidential debate, uh, health care will be one of those topics. Uh, I believed when I ran for the Senate and still believe today that the biggest short-term issue that our country deals with, has to deal with, is, is health care and health care coverage and the cost and insurance and all of that. I think that energy is the biggest midterm issue our country faces and while today it's getting the headlines uh, I, and certainly we have a major debate coming up next week, uh, it also has been one of our focuses as has the fiscal issues that our country uh, has to deal with. Health care is something that uh, uh, I was able to learn a great deal about from many of you in the room during my time as uh, Commissioner of Finance. Uh, I do not uh, envy Darren, uh, who's uh, dealing with uh, some of the issues uh, with TenCare on a daily basis. One of the reasons that I've been such an opponent of the Bush uh, changes, if you will, as it relates to GME uh, and as it relates to CPE is not just the not just the changes, but the process. I mean, one day they woke up and decided they were going to change the formula, and it's in essence what TenCare, what Vanderbilt, what all of you in this room have depended upon for some time. I think changes like that need to occur, okay? I think we do need to have reforms in how we finance health care, but I think there ought to be an orderly process. And what I, what I hope will occur is that this next beginning in January when the next president is sworn in and hopefully over the course of six or eight months after that, that we really de will deal with, with uh, health care reform in our country. So what a number of senators are trying to do that care about health care is help shape that debate. Okay, Over the course of the next uh, six months, uh, presidential candidates are going to have to take uh, uh, positions, uh, they'll be debated. Uh, uh, contrary to popular belief, I think that most people who run for public office, when they tell you what they're going to do, I think they actually try to do it, okay? Uh, sometimes uh, forces uh, keep that from occurring. So we have really, in the Senate, and in this particular case, uh, we are going to have a senator elected to the presidency. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, so in the Senate, we've really tried to make health care, if you will, uh, one of the main focuses. I have uh, co-sponsored some legislation with Senator Burr. Uh, it's, a, it's a free market approach that guarantees that every family in America, every family in America would have at least $5,400 available to buy health insurance. Now you look at the cost of a policy for a family today and you know that that in many cases will not cover. Uh, the full cost of a health care policy. It would cover a major medical policy, but not full cost. But it is a step in the right direction. It's something that is absolutely budget neutral, which is to me the way we need to focus on health care. But in addition to that, I've also co-sponsored legislation uh, with Ron Wyden out of Oregon. And uh, Ron's plan is far more comprehensive. Uh, I, would not, I would not vote for the bill if it makes it to the floor in the form that it's in today, okay? But I know that the only way we're going to have health care reform in our country is for Republicans and Democrats to sit around the same table and to come up with a solution that works. The thing I like about Ron is he's willing to focus on private coverage, okay? He's willing to do so in a way that is budget neutral, it has some components, again, that to me are not 
perfect, and certainly he knows that, and I plan to work with him on those. But the fact of the matter is that we have got to figure out a way in this country to deal with the fact that so many people in our country do not have health insurance. Now, anybody who comes to Vanderbilt or to many of the hospitals represented, and all of you, thank you for coming uh, to, to friendly territory, to one of the uh, uh, co-hospitals uh, here in the area. But the fact of the matter is that you all take that care. This hospital this year will, will spend $86 million on uncompensated care. I know you mentioned $92 million next year. Uh, those costs are shifted over to somebody, and at the end of the day, uh, we all end up paying for those, and that's not a rational system. Today, there are 800,000 Tennesseans that do not have health insurance and the cost of covering them is shifted to other providers, to other people seeking uh, health insurance by the providers who are giving that care. Sixty-nine percent of those people, by the way, have full-time employment. I think that's a pretty remarkable statistic to know that sixty-nine percent of the people today in the state of Tennessee that don't have health insurance are employed full-time. Uh, I'm committed uh, to working, uh, first of all, with our state to make sure that as we go through this process of hopefully having full coverage in America where every American has insurance, that's my goal, okay, that as we move through that process, we don't take out from under immediately until we get through that process some of those things that allow our state to continue to fill the gap. And Darren, I, want, I think you know that. And I think you've seen that by virtue of the way we work with you. I'm also committed to working uh, with people on both sides of the aisle to make sure that we get to that point and to a point where, where everybody in America actually has uh, the ability to own a private policy. Now, one of the things that worries me about what I see in Washington today, and I've said this to many of the healthcare executives, uh, I met with 41 of them over the course of the campaign and in various meetings. I ran for the Senate back in 1994. Uh, unfortunately, most of y'all don't remember that. I, I do. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the mood in the public was very different than it is today. It's an amazing difference and it's really a privilege uh, to sort of get the gauge, to, to feel the gauge, if you will, uh, of the American population being a senator but at the same time to get input from people like you who actually deal with, with so many health issues. When I ran for the Senate back in 1994, uh, the sense among people here in the state of Tennessee was we want the government to leave us alone. We, we want government to sort of be out of our hair. Now, I will say when I became Commissioner of Finance, uh, a lot of those same people were seeking all kinds of uh, things in office. It's the way uh, life works. But I, I notice a, t a tremendously different feeling among people here in the state, and that is now they're looking for government to solve so many more problems than they might have been looking to government to solve a decade ago. And my fear is that if we don't come up with a private sector focused solution that really preserves the very best that we have in our country, that really stimulates the entrepreneurialism and the technology breakthroughs that so many of you create here at Vanderbilt and the other hospitals represented, this problem is going to be solved in some form or fashion, and I'm afraid that the way we solve it uh, may end up being in a way that is not best uh, for preserving the very best that we have in the system. So I have many reasons for wanting to focus on this. I think it's a moral responsibility for all of us who have the ability to deal with this problem and make sure that Tennesseans and Americans who need health insurance have the ability to get it. I also think it's a, it's a major economic issue for us to, to stop this uh, basically shifting that takes place, but I also want to make sure that into the future our health care system, again, stays the very best in the world because of breakthroughs that each of you create. So with that, let me just say thank you for giving me the chance to say a few words. What I would prefer to do right now 
is to listen. Uh, Ann Oswalt from our office is here and she's taking notes. Uh, Ann's in the back. She's outstanding. She came from, uh, she was uh, up in Boston for a while in the private sector, has come to our office. Hunter Hagee is with her. Uh, Hunter Bethay, I call him Hunter Hagee every time. There's another. Uh, Hunter Bethay is with us. Uh, he also will be taking uh, taking notes, but what we'd like to be able to do is to follow back up with you. There are two issues uh, that present themselves in health care. One is the financing, which is much of what I've talked about today. The other is a tremendously increasing cost. I mean, we have the financing component to make sure that everybody has the ability to actually finance a system or own a, own a, own a health care policy themselves. The other is a tremendous uh, increase in cost. Uh, uh, many of the groups that represent you in the room say that at least a third of what we spend on health care doesn't go to an end that is a good end. A third of that is wasted. Uh, that's about 5% of our GDP, which is a pretty big number. So with that, Chancellor, and with that, Dr. Uh, Churchwell, I'd love to, to open up uh, to hear any comments. Uh, and for us to be able to follow up with members uh, of this panel. Uh, we're going to be doing 10 of these across the state over the next few days. Uh, we hope to take uh, the relationships created here and the information uh, to really help guide us, if you will, over the next year. And again, thank you so much uh, for attending this morning and for letting me uh, be a part of this. Comments? Uh, good morning. Welcome to uh, Nashville. Uh, we're delighted to have you back here. One of the things that those of us who spend a lot of time uh, thinking about our health care conundrums, uh, it's become a, uh, quite apparent to us is that we don't really have a health care system. Uh, we have health care sectors that intersect uh, invariably in, in some somewhat suboptimal ways. Um, What's, has there been any thought within the, the Senate and the Congress about uh, how to make those elements uh, a little bit more uh, nimble to deal with the challenges that uh, Dr. Coopwood, myself, and, and many of us in the room have to deal with? Uh, you're right, because the uninsured problem is not that uh, folks are destitute. Sixty-nine percent of Tennesseans work. You know, you, you pull into a Starbucks to get a cup of coffee, that nice young lady waiting on you, the chances are she doesn't have health insurance. She, she works every day. So how do we get to the, the lack of integration in a sense, uh, but still preserving some of the things that I know are your principles in terms of the private sector role? You know, uh, I, after I left being commissioner of finance for the state, a number of people talked to me about health care opportunities. And, and uh, uh, I ended up sort of doing what I'd always done in life but it was interesting to see how there are so many businesses that are created, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way, this is just life, but to take advantage of anomalies that exist in the healthcare system uh, to make a lot of money, okay? And at the end of the day, again, that's, that's all fine and good, and there's certainly some good technologies that have come out of that, but it was very evident that, uh, that we do not have a healthcare system. We have a a number of uh, silos, if you will, of, of groupings, of you, as you mentioned, of people who do things very, very well, but it's not tied together. One of the fundamental things that it's still hard for me to believe that we haven't made happen in this country is at least the technology uh, for those groups to talk with each other. It's, to me, uh, uh, incompetence that we have not yet, as a country, uh, calls the technology platform at least where those various entities can talk to each other. Uh, besides that, you know, I know we tried the capitation model back in the uh, uh, mid-90s where in essence, uh, Dr. Pat Patel and I were talking about that earlier, where in essence you were paid uh, per member per month just to take care of the comprehensive health care. It didn't work. Uh, for lots of reasons, but uh, I'd love to hear from this group as to how we might actually create a health care system versus a number of groups that basically do well in their own field but don't communicate well with others. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about a system where we talk to each other? I, 
Yes, I, I'm Mark Frissy, and I represent Vanderbilt on a project in Memphis, Tennessee, where the healthcare leadership has gotten together over the last four years with a lot of leadership from the state and the federal government and has agreed to, um, if you will, compete over the right thing, which is um, the, the care of individuals. I think the common denominator of everything is if you start from the end, and that is the care of an individual, and you take it back from there, both the care and the responsibilities, you get somewhere. As a result of that system, uh, we have now uh, information about one million people that's accessible with your consent under extreme privacy considerations in every emergency room in Memphis, Tennessee, doesn't matter who your payer is, doesn't matter what your plan is, doesn't matter whether you have money or not, it's clinical information. It is a result of collaboration among the health care providers. And uh, frankly, it, it, it is not primarily a technical problem. It is a problem of the way we think. And to me, the big change that took place was when we moved from the C-suite of people worrying about, as they need to, their fiduciary responsibilities to a group of about 50 people who started talking about the rights and responsibilities of individuals when they come into the emergency departments. Because when you get to 50 people, the middle layers of an organization, they're focusing about patients, their families, and what they are. And if you start with that principle, you build a version 1.0 of something that can build something that's generating in terms of right results. So we kind of abandoned all the complexities and the intermediaries and the rules and the formularies and the like and just started with pure clinical care, what people need. And it, it, that is a successful principle, I think, that your own words and your own bills kind of espouse, and that is if you remember that at the end of the day, this is all about us as individuals and our families and start from there, you can make some progress. Let me ask you this. We, 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 uh, we have these passionate debates uh, in our lunch meetings that I wish all of you could actually see. I know nobody debates anything on the Senate floor because nobody pays any attention there, but we actually uh, in private lunch meetings have pretty big debates and we debate the issue of financing Okay, and there's a rub. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you got one side of the aisle that wants to see uh, No tax code changes. Okay, and that would be my side. Okay, and obviously we can't solve this problem without having some of that And I'm open to that as you've seen by the bills that I've uh, co-sponsored then there's a side that wants to see far more government involvement, okay? Uh, and then there's some folks in the middle, I think, that, that want to want to somehow or another keep the private system there and have some tax code changes and make it all work. As we look at finance, I think we can solve the financing component, okay? I really believe it's right before us, and I actually, maybe I'm Pollyanna because I haven't been around long enough, uh, but I think we're going to do it this next year or come very close to it. Will the financing piece alone, and I think the answer is no, but I think it might move us there uh, in, a, in a good direction. Will the financing piece, if there is no cost shifting, and if everybody has access to private health insurance, which by the way, that would include Medicaid population uh, in one of the bills, is that something that would move you as providers possibly towards the kind of care you're talking about? Because there are two issues. There's a financing piece and then there's the system piece. What is it that moves us there? Because I don't think us in Washington writing a bill can make that happen. I just don't see how that's possible. If it did happen, I think it would be a very fear, fearsome thing to see. But, but how do we move that way? How do we, how do we move y'all as a group towards, uh, towards a system other than the technology piece we just mentioned? How does that happen? Senator? When you talk about changing the financial incentives, right now we, we get reimbursed for volume, not for value. And we are making progress toward outcomes and toward uh, looking at um, uh, how we change the financial structure so that, that we do focus on value. Um, that's just starting, but that needs to go a long way. Um, I compliment you uh, on, the, on the bill. Um, it, it's, it's really kind of, in a sense, easy to say, fix ERISA, fix malpractice and tort reform, and um, fix the tax code. And if you do that, you're, you're pretty far down the road. Um, but you're gonna make a lot of people mad um, when, you, when you do that. But it seems as if you're, you're, you're carefully going down that road, and, and I would certainly compliment you on that. Um, I have to say that 
I mean, I'm dean of nursing, we have 650 students. One of the ways that we can save money is to allow nurse practitioners to practice within full scope of practice. We actually only have four buckets of care. We've got primary care, complex care, uh, chron um, uh, primary, chronic, complex, and palliative. That's it. I mean, that's really all we do. And we've got a mix match of providers um, that we're trying to slot into these four areas. Primary care can be done mostly by non-physician providers. Um, chronic care is kind of a mix. Complex is pretty much all physicians. And palliative, um, we certainly need physicians and nurses there, but we also need family and we need uh, other support systems that will allow people to remain at home. So part of, your, of, of, of the challenge that you're facing in terms of the financing of the system is that we don't have the right providers at the right place doing the right thing for the right amount of money for the right reasons. And so, so that complicates your challenge, but um, we would certainly be ready to help you think through that. But, but if, 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 let's, let's just imagine that somehow or another the, the federal government was able to come together and figure out a way of, to finance everyone having access to an adequate health care policy. You don't want, there's no way we can intelligently be involved in making sure then the system works. I'm asking you, how, did, how does that happen among providers at well, one, that point? Uh, one of the problems, I mean, Mitt Romney put in insurance in, in um, Massachusetts and 7,000 people have insurance cards and there are no providers to see them. They can't get I, an appointment. I understand. So, so part of the dilemma is, is to to go along parallel paths so that we do have the providers available as we fix the system. You can't do, you can't do one without the other. Yes, sir. Senator, uh, pick up a little bit on Dr. Riley and um, um, Dr. Welch's points. The trick is that we, we do not have a system approach to practice. And, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to mean an organization system, but we don't have a systematic way of working. And the, um, what, right now what we have are silos that compete in a zero-sum game. And if we add financing, it's still a zero-sum game. The only way a payer can affect what a provider does is to, is to negotiate for us to do less or receive less. And the and and um, and with a government with with Medicare, ninety percent, ninety six percent of the dollar goes through direct care. With commercial insurance, it's eighty to eighty three percent. So we've got a siloed system that competes that can only compete against each other in a zero sum game. We're we're gonna have to get to a system where we, in essence, compete on the value we provide for a coordinated set of care for a patient. The median Medicare beneficiary sees two primary care physicians and five specialists each year. The person with complex chronic conditions sees 16. So, um, so our, you know, we, we are going to have to um, I mean, I agree with your, your instinct that the government cannot mandate this from the outside, but somehow we're going to have to change the way that the players interact with each other and how we, in essence, uh, define value and compete for value um, across a coordinated set of care. So, so let me just ask you, if, if, if there's... If, if we figure out miraculously somehow for us as a country to come together around financing, which I think we may do, or may in large part do this next year, to me, the private sector, all of you guys have got to figure out the balance. I mean, I, I just, I don't know Medicare, we, we administer that and I realize that's almost, uh, you know, that's a huge part of the care that takes place, but it seems like in the, the private sector, ought to lead somehow in figuring out what that model is. I, I just find it... So, so no, how do you define private sector? Well, I, I define 
all of you that don't do what Darren and I do <laughs> is being private sectors. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think we would, I would throw that out. I think we would define differently. Yeah. Because there are different missions all across the board that somehow, sometimes match, sometimes don't. And that may be one of the issues that we have to deal with and we may need help in dealing with. Well, and I, I agree with what was said. I mean, we have a fragmented system today with regards, to, you know, in Medicaid, we could be doing one thing and driving toward one solution, you know, incentivizing some behavior over here while I have a commercial payer probably incentivizing you on something totally different. And the reality is, as a provider, you're not flipping the card going, well, this is a Medicaid patient. I'm going to treat this person this way, and this is a commercial payer. I'm going to treat this person this way. We should all, as payers in the system for providers, agree on how are we going to incentivize payment for quality outcomes as opposed to this fee-for-service, which I do believe breeds overutilization in the system. You can throw more financing into the system, but I still think the underlying problem's there. You have to address some of that system as why. And as these fragmented silos, I think it makes it difficult. Medicaid can deal with Medicaid, but I can't necessarily on my own drive the commercial market. And that's some of the things we're trying to do is bridge that divide with the other payers and agree to what are some things we can focus on and try to move the continuum. You know, Senator, what I'd, what I'd like to add to that is how do we change private sector as you as you define um, re really centers a lot of activity around where the incentives are I mean it's kind of how medicine has gone over the years you, you'll see um, more activity where there where there's incentives to encourage that activity and how do you change the incentives to go to a value base and that may be something that can be led from a governmental standpoint to help change the, the whole perspective on, on, on how um, health care is delivered because if you truly incentivize value, uh, incentivize outcomes, um, you're now starting to start doing those changes that, that Darren talks about because right now I, I see you as many times as I need to see you through the office or to create the revenue to sustain my practice in, in the community wherever that is. So. I think there's where government can help in that. I, I don't want, obviously, government to take over in that, but at least help in changing that. Yeah. I think that yeah, we, we, we have, let me just, I'm sorry, we have such difficulty, it seems, uh, <coughs> defining the services themselves. I mean, you know, that's constantly being gained, and then we're constantly refining, and, and for us to define outcomes, uh, to me, I, which I agree, by the way, 100%, that that's what we all ought to be pushing towards. It just seems to me, though, that the, the private sector, if you will, and I, I talk about all those providers out there uh, which are so well represented here, there ought to be some model that, that, that the private sector, all of you, can come up with to help us do that. I just think it's a very difficult thing to do top down. but. Uh, but maybe, maybe that's the case. I just watch what we do with such, uh, uh, there's, it's not surgical. Everything we do is a blunt object, and it just seems to me that uh, a better place for that to come is from you. But, uh, well, just yes, sir. Comment. My name is Jim Jurgis. I'm Chief Medical Information Officer at Vanderbilt, and I work in the space of prevention, and uh, what I see as a primary care doc is trying to manage populations around agreed upon, you know, colon cancer screening for people who are in a system is that we have multiple different payers. All of them, most of the ones I deal with are coming to my door now saying we want to we want to start paying differently and supporting the infrastructure for quality. And where, where we find ourselves today is that there's a willingness because they're, the employers are coming to them to say where's the value, where's the quality. But what is missing uh, really in, in my estimation are two things. One is an agreement over what exactly those targets are and what is a measure for even simple prevention. Um, but in addition, the systems that are built around payment and what Colleen said earlier, uh, paying for piecework. <clears throat> Most of our data systems are meant to pay for piecework. Now we have incentives, however strong or weak they may be, where people are wanting to come to the table, but we don't have the infrastructure to handle the information and to define the information. So most of my time, talking about 30% of wasted time just of people trying to manage that, comes in trying to adjudicate multiple different payers, get them to agree on the same set of measures so that a, a medical organization can begin managing to it. 
the willingness to pay um, and the willingness to recognize a set of value targets is there in my estimation, at least in the, our market, but our ability to actually work that to meaningful numbers across multiple payers, I think there's a vacuum of, of standards and agreed upon incentives to hit those. When I work with Blue Cross or HealthSpring or others, we the providers are able to, to get them to start talking about exactly the same measures without nuances that are different. And from my standpoint, there's a, there's a real role for helping to identify interoperable technologies across systems and to define what the values are. Then you can, then you, when you have incentives in place and you don't have a system to measure and manage to it, I think um, the incentives can sometimes come before the ability to, to realize them. And one of my fears is if we start incentivizing again to quality before we have a system in place that knows what it's talking about, we'll start creating problems that we didn't realize. For instance, people with a lot of serious medical problems who may not be, um, who may not take care of their health, actually being uh, disenrolled or, or, or provider groups being disincentive to take those patients because it'll make their quality numbers look worse. Mm -hmm. So from my standpoint, it really starts with understanding what it is we're measuring to process or outcome measures. Too much on the outcome, you start disen having incentive to disenroll tough patients and, and um, supporting the infrastructure for, for technologies that talk to each other. Until we do those, I'm a little bit of afraid at really strong incentives without a system in place to, to, to manage the truth. Yeah, uh, Senator, uh, Dr. Georges and I had op-ed pieces in Tennessee, and I guess about a couple months ago, about this, this issue because, it, uh, you know, I'm worried as, as a leader of an institution that has trained uh, physicians and other healthcare professionals for 132 years to take care of poor folks and the underserved that when those type of schemes are overlaid too heavily, and I think we're now seeing some evidence, there was a paper that came out in the New England Journal or one of the journals last week that says that, that's suggesting rather that the paper performance thing could really do more harm to the care of the indigent and underserved than what was intended. So, you know, we're, we're, we're concerned about that. And I think Jim's, Jim's uh, point about that is, is germane. Now, another thing, Senator, quite frankly, is the moose on the table is the whole issue of the government involved in health care. And, you know, former Senator Bro still tells this story uh, about a little old lady in the airport stopping him saying, Senator, no matter what you do up there, don't let them touch my Medicare. Uh, because, you know, people just don't realize that is a government program. It's probably, arguably, one of the best government programs we've ever had. And as a former active clinician, I tell you, I would prefer to deal with Medicare on a daily basis than deal with Aetna, Cigna, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, because I remember how miserable they made my life as a practicing clinician. You know, having a, somebody with a high school education behind a computer screen denying coverage for something that I order uh, and so forth. And many of us who are clinicians have had that experience. So that's why we don't look at the Medicare scheme with such a jaundiced eye. Now, the problem is Medicare is not kept pace with modern day realities. So is there a way to uh, get to the best features of quote government medicine a la Medicare but still have an appropriate calibrated role for the private sector in whatever we do going forward? I think, and I, I think that's a question and by the way uh, and this is not uh, I know some members of the media here this is not a position that I support uh, but uh, one of the one of the solutions by uh, hard-working senators uh, that, that have a slightly different perspective than I do is to let Medicare be the system, okay, and let it be uh, the way that we cover all Americans. And, and uh, there, there's actually a number of people who strongly support that. I'd love to hear any comments that any of you may have. The, the way costs are running so rampant in Medicare, it just seems that that would bankrupt uh, our country uh, even even more quickly than that, that's right but I mean they want to spread that throughout the entire population I'd, I'd love to hear any editorial comments as it relates to that and I know that, that one of the two of you have a comment um, I'm Nancy Annis with St. Thomas Health Services and Ascension Health and we're the largest nonprofit health system in the United States and we see uh, one uninsured person every second in our ministries across our country and uh, you were talking about a model of care, of system of care. And we know we need to transform our health care delivery system. There's no doubt about that. But we do have a model here in Nashville called the Bridges to Care Program 
which has been such a successful program for our uninsured population in our, in our county, Davidson County and Nashville. It truly, everyone, 22 clinics came together and all the hospitals in this room came together and we just put everything aside and said, we're gonna take care of these folks. We're gonna take care of the uninsured. People get where they need, they get the preventative care, they get the primary care, they get referred to a specialist as needed, and if they need a diagnostic or even a surgery, each hospital has agreed to provide care for that patient. So that's a potential model where everyone came together around one basic mission, and that was to serve those who needed our help and who were uninsured. So I think that it can be done, and I think we all are uh, here and willing to collaborate with everyone in this room, every hospital and every provider. Well, and I think maybe the reason that's worked is you were unencumbered uh, <laughs> by being paid by people who are paying you for certain services. Uh, unfortunately, you were not being paid, but and you were able to set up a model that didn't have the sort of the perverse incentives, if you will, that, uh, that people are talking about in the room. That's right. yeah, I, can I, I, I'm more optimistic than some of the conversation. You said you thought the financing could be addressed. Then, I, I mean, yeah. you seem pretty optimistic I, about that. I feel that. like we will go a long ways. Mm -hmm. We have a chance to go a long ways towards <laughs> taking care of the financing, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that occurs. And then we have sort of the more negative conversation. Right, but, but it seems to me, <laughs> maybe I'm just the ulti ultimate optimist, but um, it seems that these are transition issues. Jim and uh, Bill and, and everyone else are talking about how do you go from a, to a kind of what we call an efficiency system, where you look at results and bang for the buck. But then Wayne and others legitimately raise, well, if you're just going to measure what are the health care outcomes, you're going to have an adverse selection problem. So doesn't this get us back into the question of some sort of universal care so that when we get to the outcomes measurement, we're not cherry picking patients? Isn't, is, yeah. is that the issue you're worried about? Yes, because you don't want the adverse selection. But um, you know, we see when people get in systems where you can define those things and have the information talk, um, then people can start managing the value. Most of our quality targets at Vanderbilt over the past two years have gone from a little ahead of the average of 55% of the time, the right thing being done, to now 90%. And that only came particularly out of one of Medicare's plans, the health plan, by Medicare made some changes within its population that incentivized the health plan and some of the, the companies they hire to partner with the doctors in ways that the incentives weren't in place before. When that happened, infrastructure <coughs> support for the, for the practices, incentives, and the balance between outcomes and quality metrics occurred to allow remarkable performance that decreased cost in that population by decreased ER visits and hospitalization. So one of the arguments is if we get a system in place, it, it will require investment and partnerships in ways we haven't before. If the financing is in place, my, then, then that issue um, is in part solved because we don't have people who don't have an ability to get into the system. So my point is that Medicare can lead the way. I don't know about whether we end up with a single party system, but I see, I go to all the meetings, Blue Crosses and others, they're looking at what Medicare is doing. Most of them are asking us to start piloting a Medicare-ish type program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to answer one of the questions of, of how can the federal government help in the private market, I think by leading and showing the way, I think that's a key, a key role. Let me mention uh, two components to, to the widen bill too. That that first of all, there's a there is no adverse selection. In other words, you have to take all comers. Okay, it's a and that's one of the controversial aspects. I mean, there's a you know committee rating system, and you know whoever Blue Cross or whoever has to take all comers. The other piece of it is this is very controversial. Is you know at the end of the day, while people are able to maintain coverage through their employer. They're allowed to do that. The incentives, uh, by virtue of the way the bill is set up, will create a system where you are not covered by your employer. You will actually buy your coverage directly from the insurance uh, entity. One of the things I saw, uh, Darren, when I was Commissioner of Finance, there was so much churn 
there was no reason for any insurance entity to ever spend any of the preventive health money on preventive care. Why would they do it? There's going to be churn in three years you're out, two years you're out, four years you're out. And I, I guess I do somewhat think that if insurance companies thought they actually were going to have a relationship with you for 10 or 20 or 30 years, that alone might change to some degree the way they dealt with you. And my sense is that if you actually owned your own policy, you didn't own it through your employer where you were changing jobs the way Americans should change, <coughs> then you might have a relationship whereby insurance companies over time didn't just have term insurance like we have in life insurance, but you might actually have policies that more merit whole life insurance like life insurance uh, companies do that plan on being with you for many, many years. So maybe uh, maybe that's a missed, uh, misperceived opportunity, but to me, having that long-standing relationship alone uh, would somewhat change the way insurance companies uh, want to deliver care to the people they insure. Senator, um, yeah. I have uh, the privilege of managing the four hospitals. And um, the system is uh, to, to have financing and health care coverage for all is a huge and vital step. But <clears throat> underlying that is that the system is set up today to reward those who provide health care for increased resource utilization. And that is an escalating cost which is essentially out of control and people know how to utilize that system. So as we go through this process, it's going to be critical to balance that out and examine that in depth because there will never be enough dollars in the system if we continue to award resource utilization versus providing the, the investigative uh, uh, treatments or the investigative um, tests that are needed for the patient versus the investigative tests that, that reward the physicians or whoever for doing them. So that's a critical part of it. That is growing at an astronomical rate. The other part that underlies whether this can work or not is that we have many different cultures in the provider system. And we have the for-profit system, we have the non-for-profit system, we have the non-for-profit academic teaching systems, and then you have the safety hospitals. All of those have to take a equal responsibility in the process and it can't be shifted to those who sit in the academic system or in the safety provider hospitals. So the for-profits and, and we have all kind of laws going for Congress to, to determine how the non-for-profits are performing, all of them have to come to the table with an equal amount of um, desire to solve the problem. So I think providing insurance is critical. But underlying that, there are many issues that could make this thing become even more complicated. Senator, I don't think um, some of the discussion helps, really comes to grips with the magnitude of the choice problem we face. You know, um, there's, there's good data that 10% of the avoidable cause of death relates to shortfalls in health care. So we're spending 95% of the U.S. tax of health dollars on 10% of the problem. 40% of it is behavioral, only about half of that being substance abuse. 30% is genetic, about 2% of that direct, the rest end are brought out by lifestyle, et cetera. About 20% is environmental. Um, the, about 5% of, of that being um, toxic. So the, the things we're talking about, you know, I think we really have to come to grips with how we're going to make those choices. And, and I understand that it will be hard to do that in a centralized fashion, but this, there's, there's a, the magnitude of the choices we have to make dwarf the, the kind of discussions we're having about adding prevention to what, what we're doing, I believe. Let's uh, take one more comment or question. Yes, sir. Senator. Um, first of all, I commend the work that you're doing in the area of financing health care. Uh, obviously a big challenge. Uh, but I really believe that before we can do that effectively, we need to have debate about whether or not health care is uh, a right or a privilege. 
And depending on who you talk to in this country, it's really kind of bounced around all over the place whether or not it's a right uh, or a privilege. Is going to the restaurant a right or a privilege? Is purchasing a car a right or a privilege? And as you sit in the emergency rooms today of hospitals and you see people uh, there seeking health care, is that a right or is that a privilege? And I just think there needs to be debate about that because I think once those questions are answered, uh, the financing question might be a little bit easier. Well, listen, I, uh, this has been most sobering. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the day after uh, Memorial Day, and I'm not uh, quite back in the swing of things. I will be. Uh, Y'all are putting me there very quickly, though. And uh, let, me, let me just, first of all, I, the, the resources that exist here in Middle Tennessee as it relates to, to health care and just the knowledge and the the training and just the the what what all of you have to to give to the health care debate is huge maybe maybe as big as any place in the country um, and I thank you for coming out to, to talk with me today I, the, my takeaways from this uh, uh, are the the little miniature issue of dealing with financing is just a uh, a minor issue, and I say that uh, facetiously uh, somewhat, uh, compared to some of the other issues that the system itself uh, has to deal with. And I, I think that's a daunting thing to think about. I do still think that moving towards a financing mechanism that, that causes y'all not to have to game the system uh, and maybe by having a financing system, uh, we don't have so much of the not everybody playing fairly, and I've heard that a great deal while I was Commissioner of Finance, and I know, generally speaking, what you're alluding to. But I think that uh, the fact is that uh, uh, most of us, the debate you're talking about, about uh, you know that debate about whether it's a right or a privilege, I think the country, and I will just say me personally, I think that we believe that there's a moral responsibility for us to figure out a way to, to deal with that. And through EMTALA and other things that y'all deal with, it's already been stated that everybody's going to be taken care of who comes into the emergency room, I think. Uh, I, I, uh, I think we're at a point in America where we're willing to somehow solve this problem. And uh, I, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, the financing piece, piece I think would be a big step, but I realize that uh, because of the financing that we've had in the past, we've actually driven the system to, to bad behaviors, let's face it. Yeah. And, uh, and so we've got to figure out a way once uh, we, we, if we can figure out a way to make sure that everybody has coverage, we then have to move away from these bad habits, if you will, that we've installed in the system. I think one of the first big steps certainly would have the technology, having the technology to be able to communicate with each other. But I actually think, again, that Middle Tennessee, I'm going to be throughout this entire state, obviously, looking at this issue. This has got to be a place where leadership is taken. Um, there's too much in the way of investment uh, here and knowledge and entrepreneur ability for this not to be one of the places uh, where the right model, if you will, is conceived and followed through upon and I hope that you guys will utilize us in some ways. I know that we're blunt instruments because we're in the public arena but I hope that you will use us. I hope that you will help us do those things that are appropriate in the public sector and I challenge you to do those things if you will uh, in the private sector to help us all make this work out. I, I do again believe it's a moral issue that it's time our country solved and I think if we can move beyond uh, again, financing, we can move way down the road towards the issues that you're talking about. So, Chancellor, thank you. Uh, I am honored to be around so many smart people. Uh, I realize that uh, we've probably affected the P&Ls of many of the companies you represent by y'all being away so long, but we're honored to have you, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.